Welcome to LSO St. Luke's. A huge welcome to the LSO's principal cello, David Cohen, and pianist Alina Prichulenko. Let's give him a lovely, warm welcome. We begin today with Elgar. So when we think of Elgar nowadays, we think of this great English composer, one of the greatest English composers of all time. But the truth is that Elgar took quite a long time to find any fame or recognition. And he always felt like he didn't quite fit in, like he was the wrong religion or the wrong class or he had the wrong taste. This piece is written, was written three or four years before he found his mega fame with the Enigma Variations. And it was written during a happy time because he had just got married. Oh. And we can hear all of that loveliness in the music. It is the wonderful, and you probably will recognize it straight away, Chanson du Martin.
were amazingly well lit then by the sun. It's gone now, but it did look amazing. Um, Russian composer Glazunov is next, and he, for a very short period after the death of Tchaikovsky and before the emergence of Stravinsky, was the number one Russian composer for about 20 years. And then Stravinsky came along, and a bit after that, Shostakovich, and suddenly Glazunov sounded incredibly old-fashioned because he didn't sort of move with the political turmoil and with the times. And then when he died, the critics rather un... rather kind of horribly said that they thought he died years ago, which is a little bit rude, isn't it? Of course, none of this music is old-fashioned now because in some ways all of it is old-fashioned and that's what makes it glorious to us. So we're going to hear his minstrel, Song of the Minstrel. So you have to imagine a minstrel which is kind of wandering, now I'm lit by the sun, aren't I? Uh, wandering busker and these minstrels are always doing romantic, kind of painful, passionate music, and that is exactly what this is.
composer is the truly wonderful Nadia Boulanger. Now, she went on to be a, an iconic teacher of usually male composers, and almost any male composer you can think of from the second half of the 20th century was taught by Nadia Boulanger. She was also a pioneering conductor and was the first woman conductor to conduct many of our famous orchestras, not this one, but many of the others. But at the beginning of her career, she wanted to be a composer, and she wanted to win the prestigious Prix de Rome, which was the big composition prize that all the major French composers won. And then her younger sister came along and won it on first attempt. And, now, I know, and Nadia immediately declared herself useless and stopped composing outright, never wrote another note, which is really sad, because this piece that we're going to hear, which is the first of her three pieces for cello, shows an enormous skill. And because it's from around about 1914, it's in a very French style because it sort of emulates the great Debussy. And we can hear that in the dreamy piano accompaniment.
You know, the music choices just keep getting better and better today. I mean, this is just, this is my type of music. Um, next up, we have Rachmaninoff. Um, so Rachmaninoff has a lot in common with Elgar and Glazunov, who we heard earlier on, because like Elgar, it took a while for Rachmaninoff to achieve the fame that we now know him for. And that's because when he wrote his first symphony, it was ruined by the conductor, who conducted it blind drunk. And that conductor was Glazunov. Oh. And that meant that Rachmaninoff just kind of shut down, and he was kind of like, I can't write anything else, and went into a complete physical and mental panic. And he was saved by a newfangled thing called psychiatry and also hypnosis. And he came back with a bang because he came back with his second symphony and the mighty and beloved second piano concerto. And from then on, it was all great for Rachmaninoff, except for the fact that he was called, that word again, old-fashioned, because he didn't move with the times. This is his vocalese, which is a song without words. So originally it was written for a singer, and the singer would choose any syllable to sing it on, and it has a lovely meandering sort of never-ending melody. And it's all of the things that we love about Rachmaninoff, because it is melancholic, it is romantic, it is restless, and it is just gorgeous.
this is the point in the concert where if anybody's got any questions, now's your chance. Uh, if you're at home, get typing. And if you're in the room, there's a microphone there that will magically come towards you. We have one on the screen which says, I can only see half of it, what has been your favorite piece to practice and play? together for, for today's program. And this is from Yashbi in India. Well, hello, and thanks for the question. So probably my favorite piece that we rehearsed and played today was the Glazunov, for the simple reason that I haven't played that piece in 30 years. <laughs> Actually, I played it when I was 30 and I recorded it. It was probably one of my first recordings. And that piece has, has stayed, you know, it has marked me. Actually, I probably made every single student of mine actually play it, but I never ever got a chance to actually put it in the program. So when the LSO asked me to do this, I thought, right, it's time to get back on the horse, gotta get that old piece out of the library, and that's what we did. Are any of your students in today? I think, yeah, there are a few. I see oh. some ex students, some current ones, potentially new ones, perhaps. <laughs> I don't know. So they'll be telling you what, what I, you're going to do? Yeah, they'll be telling me afterwards, well, you told us not to do this finger in. I said, yeah, I know, I know. So. And what was your favorite piece? Well, definitely Rachmaninoff because of its harmonies. And uh, that was just so incredible when we just mm. played together. And we didn't really need to second rehearse because we, I think, it was such a nice communication and connection between us and regarding all these harmonies. Even though we weren't really doing all the dynamics that are written, <laughs> but we were trying to fill them together and I think that was really remarkable rehearsal. There you go. So you weren't doing exactly what Right Man Enough wanted, but <laughs> who cares? Um, okay, let's have a question from inside the hall, if there is one. Maybe you're all shy today because it's streamed. Oh, there's one all the way over here. Oh, this is my friend from North London Cares. Thank you. I'm hearing the music a little bit different now because I'm trying to make some music of my own. So I'm hearing it a little bit more deeper. Thank you. Oh, great. So this is my friend Peter, who's on one of our discovery projects, and we're going to be writing some songs together. So he's saying that he's hearing musically a bit differently now which is great to hear, thank you. There's a little bit of feedback going on, so I'm a little bit wary. I'll just stay still for the moment. And I'll read one from the screen, which says, what kind of cello do you play? And that's Charlotte in Bristol. And I'm gonna give you the mic, just in case it's me that's doing the feedback. Right, do you want, do you want the short or the long story? Uh, well, the orchestra are coming in later, as you know, for rehearsal, so just say. So, okay, I'm very blessed to be playing on, the, on a wonderful uh, Venetian cello. Uh, it's a Dominicus Montagnana. Uh, I've had the pleasure of playing on it for now 17, 18 years. Uh, now you've all heard, of course, of Stradivarius, you know, instruments, violins. There are also wonderful cellos. Uh, but actually, um, us cellists, professionals, we tend to almost gravitate towards more of the Montagnana instead of the Stradivarius, if one has the actual choice. I mean, already it's amazing to just be offered just one. Um, the Montagnana is a slightly darker instrument, as you can even see from, from its actually uh, varnish. And yes, you may, have, you may think that maybe I should polish my cello a little bit more, but actually that's the original varnish. Montagnana used to always kind of mess it up a little bit. Um, so um, yes, so that's my baby for the last 18 years, and uh, I hope I can keep hold on to it for much, much longer time. And how old is it? Um, it so it was, uh, it's 1735, so, you know, it's gonna be almost 300 years. It's gonna be a big birthday at home, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, Katie from Oslo, excellent, says, who were your biggest inspirations growing up? Well, there are so many, but in the classical um, part, um, I was blessed to actually meet some of the, you know, dinosaurs of our time, you know, like, you know, Yehudi Menuhin, which I got the chance to not only, you know, work with, but play with also. Uh, also, Rostropovich was a big influence. Um, I had the privilege of uh, working with, um, and I just forgot his name. 
oh my god, this is terrible. Um, Svetlanov, that was the name. Oh my goodness, thank god, thank goodness. Incredible conductor, actually quite an inspiration. Um, yeah, so th there are just so many, uh, but I guess... Yeah, I just was born just at the right time to meet these guys. Yeah. Could you pass the mic to Alina to answer the same? No. no. <laughs> so who were your inspirations? Uh, for me, it was definitely Henrik Neuhaus, the famous um, son of another famous pianist. Um, and, um, well, sorry, no, Stanislav Neuhaus. That was the son of Henrik Neuhaus. I just got mixed, uh, the same um, last names. Um, yeah, I was just really inspired by his uh, last recital that was given in Moscow. Don't remember the year. He was playing all his um, fourth ballads by Chopin. And unfortunately, because it was such an intense recital and he was giving all himself into the music, unfortunately, he, he died couple of days after that recital, which was, yeah. But it's just really worth to listen to the, that recital and that really inspired me to just go on and play Chopin's music. Great. Let's have, is there another one in the hall? You're shy today. Yeah, I think it's because the cameras, you know, when the cameras are here, everyone gets a bit shy. Uh, okay, great. Wait, wait for the microphone, otherwise we'll get into terrible trouble. It's, 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 okay. There you go. Uh, you said you, is it your cello or is it a lent one? <laughs> because you said, I hope to keep it, so. Now we're getting into the nitty gritty. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes, the white limo outside is mine. <laughs> I, I wished that the instrument was mine. Unfortunately, uh, as some of you might know, being a uh, classical musician is not a profession where you aspire to necessarily become rich and able to actually afford. Uh, it's more of a passion, it's a vocation. It's something that we just love doing. Um, so I'm just very lucky that this instrument was bought for me and was lent to me until, normally until I desire, I, I no longer desire to play the instrument. So it is on loan, unfortunately, but still, I'm very, very grateful. There you go. The last question is from the screen, which is, how often do you play together? And that's from Natasha. I don't believe it's our second time playing just together. Wow. <laughs> yeah, we played first um, at the end of June, I believe. Yeah, doing some great music like Schnittke, Paganini, and so on. And uh, just for the second time, he just hit me up, I was like, do you want to play another time? I was like, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> because it was such a great time spending together, rehearsing, so they just, I felt that connection, I was like, let's just make great music together one, once again. Great, well, I hope you play together again and again and again. It's a great partnership. Um, our next, thank you for your questions, our next concert, I've got to get, there we go. Our next concert here is on the 20th of October and features a wind quintet from the Guildhall and they'll be playing music by Valerie Coleman and Sally Beamish, which might be new sounding composers to you. Um, so come along and find out about them. That one's not streamed, so you'll have to come live at 12.30 on the 20th. Uh, our last piece is by Manuel de Faya, Spanish composer. So de Faya was really keen that he became bigger than just being known as a Spanish composer, writing Spanish sounding music. So he left Spain and he traveled to Paris where he hung out with people such as Stravinsky and Ravel and, not Romano, Debussy and Diaghilev and all these amazing people. And he did get really, really famous. We're talking about 1910, that sort of time. And then he got really famous, bizarrely, for writing Spanish sounding music. And this is no exception because this is four of his seven Spanish folk songs. And these are traditional Spanish songs that he's added an extra twist to. So we're going to hear four of them back to back. Basically, we're going to hear a lullaby, a dance, a lament, and we're going to end with some feisty drama. <laughs> 